Well, this is used to silence anybody else that uh, was going to investigate this. You know, and by the way, see, those sheriffs right then should have just arrested those feds. I mean, clearly, you're covering this up. You were involved. But see, n not in America now. Oh, you're a fed. Uh, oh, let me grovel to you. But, but again, dovetailing this, look at Fast and Furious. Look at how it, they were shipping the guns into Mexico, drugs back in. It's even in the New York Times now, but nobody's in trouble. And ABC just came out with internal uh, emails saying that they were going to use this uh, event to uh, issue new gun control legislation. I mean, it's just out in the open now. Um, something else that was interesting about Terry Yakey is one of the hallmarks of an ammonium nitrate and fuel oil bomb is a nitric gas cloud. Anytime that it was used in Ireland uh, 41 years ago last August in Sterling Hall, uh, they set off an ammo bomb. The first 26 responders were hospitalized from inhalation of nitric gas. That did not occur at the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, Terry Yakey was on the scene within minutes and saved eight people's lives that day. All of the survivors said that they, they had no problem with respiration other than a little bit of the smoke from the cars that were out front. So there was no ammonium nitrate gas, which calls into question that AMFA was even used at all. No, they did that to then start tracking farmers and teach that, you know, the American people are terrorists. Now, again, why were they so scared of Terrence Yankee? I mean, you interview his mother in this film. I believe that's the first time she's been interviewed in the film. I mean, folks, I can't tell you, this is a true investigative masterwork, and it's cyanide to these vampires. This is a big old bucket of holy water, a big old silver cross to Cal Dracula, but you've got to get it, and you've got to use it against them. Uh, what, I've, I've, I'll just ask you on air, what, uh, what's your stance on folks airing this on Access TV? Oh, we encourage it. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, set up a local screening, they can get in contact with us at contact at freemindfilms.com. We'll send them movie posters that they can use to promote it. Other people are talking about putting it in the libraries. They can go to InfoWars store, buy it there, put it in the libraries, uh, you know, get the word out. We've had, uh, in fact, a member of the bombing committee, uh, very active in a local parish here in, in uh, Oklahoma City, wants to do a showing at his church. We encourage that. I'm looking forward to meeting the pastor. So the word. Well, Americans couldn't believe the government was this evil 15, 16 years ago. But doesn't Fast and Furious and Tonkin being declassified and all this stuff being out now and that us evil 9/11 truthers question things? We've broken the ice, so people now understand this. But why do you think all these White House advisors are so arrogant? It's like five of them now are pleading, if we just had one, it would really help you. I mean, how dumb do they think we are to be writing articles saying, we'll blame our enemies, we really need one? And obviously the higher-ups are going, no, they're on to us, we can't do it. They're intoxicated with arrogance, Alex, and after, and you know all the intel on this, most of it, and what we've seen, I, you're right, it's absolutely unbelievable that they can get up in the morning and look at themselves in the mirror and think that they can actually get away with this. They have no value for human life, and we saw it firsthand here. Yeah, when you look at the, uh, you know, all of the criteria of a psychopath, these people actually meet all of the criteria. They believe that we are actually lesser beings than they are, and they have no uh, remorse for, you know, riding our ashes uh, to, to their own political ends. Now, the head of the FBI's counterterrorism group claimed he was in Dallas and got a Southwest flight. Turned out he didn't fly. They have the hotel receipts. He's that arrogant. We know some of the teams that were already there. And so from your deep research, because you guys are nose to the grindstone on this, go through some more of the points, but, 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 but also as, as best we can tell exactly who was involved in this. From my research, what it's, it's, it's FBI, high-level government special forces, some private think tanks, some foreign intelligence operatives, uh, and FBI. Well, we have a, uh, here in Oklahoma, in eastern Oklahoma, we have a white separatist compound called Elohim City. Now, this seemed to be a base of operations uh, for the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, you had uh, FBI informant Carol Howe, I'm sorry, ATF informant Carol Howe, was telling the ATF prior to the Oklahoma City bombing that these people were scouting out locations to attack federal buildings. Now, there was foreknowledge there. We've got a witness, an uh, actual resident of Elohim City, that says that he can place Timothy McVeigh on site. Uh, so yeah, they were using it as a cutout, and the Southern Poverty Law Center had operatives in there, correct? Exactly, yes, and that's sir. some of the documents that Jesse Trinidu has uncovered, is that there were at least six uh, Southern Poverty Law Center operatives at Elohim City at the time. And, you know, he said anytime you've got five people talking about overthrowing the government, three of them are working for the government. And it looks like they're using the Southern Poverty Law Center as a, as a private wing of the FBI and ATF to be able to, to do operations that, uh, you know, they wouldn't normally be able to do because of, you know, any restrictions of the institutions. Yeah. So 
out of that uh, city, you've got Andreas Strassmeyer. Now, that's the uh, that's the gentleman that uh, Jane Graham saw in the basement with the, the gray putty and wire. Mm -hmm. He was working out of Elohim City at the same time that McVeigh was there. Um, so, you know, these are the these are the players that, that tie all of this together. Now, why were so many Iraqis brought in uh, that have been brought in after the first Gulf War by Bush Sr. And, and Clinton? Was that a cover story or a, a, an emergency plan B to blame it on uh, Arabs and Muslims uh, if the domestic terror route didn't go well? You know, that's a red herring, Alex. I wish we could put a better thumb on that, but uh, you're right. There were over 5,000 refugees that were located to the uh, the Midwest and the Oklahoma City uh, area in Oklahoma. A lot of uh, the folks that were suspect on this case, uh, we know that some of them still live here in the city, and uh, it's, it's very, very disgusting to see that they weren't brought into custody. We know that some of them were complicit, but we, we just couldn't include that in the film because we didn't have enough definitive information. Another thing that concerns me about that is former CIA Director uh, Woosley is actually uh, now publicly stating, yes, uh, you know, he thinks that there was uh, al-Qaeda involvement and such. It looks like they're trying to use this to uh, yeah. support the, the you know, well, I've always the said they were going to double back because those guys were trained by the CIA when Saddam was, quote, the U.S. ally. And so that's why they were brought back out. Most of them were double agents who were helping give intel on Saddam. So they were brought back out at the end of the last Gulf War. And so we know some of them were videotaped, were involved, and then were allowed to leave the country. So, again, this is a classic intel op where they've got layer after layer so that no one knows the full story but the uh, mastermind. I, I wonder what Mr. Holter can tell us. Yeah, exactly. And that's why we need to hold these people accountable. They're still in positions of power today. You know, we see that McVeigh was actually uh, telling his family and everybody that he was actually working for the government to uh, fly drugs into the United States and assassinate security risks. Uh, even, uh, you know, Terry Nichols, after he had gone through his uh, federal and state trials, was saying that, you know, he was ready to spill the beans about the other people that were involved. And people will question, well, if McVeigh was involved with all these other people and he was about to be put to death, why does he not, you know, uh, you know turn them out and tell them what happened? Well, I I think that uh, you know the the presence uh, of Dr. Jolly and West. Uh, he consulted with uh, McVeigh's defense team uh, after his arrest. He was the number two psychological warfare expert in the country, just under Dr. Ewan Cameron. And he worked with Patty Hearst, Saran Saran, and Jack Ruby. Now, after that, uh, stay there. You can't make this up. He was the assigned doctor for him from the arrest up to the execution. Every time McVeigh was on TV, he was drugged out of his gourd. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Folks, I cannot express to you enough that exposing false flag terror is the key at this temporal level of existence to bringing down these people because everything they do is stage a crisis, offer a solution. They stage a global financial crisis, take over society as a solution. On record, they don't even deny that. They stage, uh, oh my gosh, carbon dioxide is deadly, the earth's going to die, we've got to tax and control everything. To save the earth. Oh my gosh, we've got to take all your rights and invade and attack all these countries because you're in danger and they're going to blow stuff up. It's the oldest trick in the book problem, reaction, solution. And again, I'm not going to push this much more. I just hope that you get the gift of truth this Christmas, whether it's all 18 of my films on DVD or 70% off and 18 different gifts. You can do all your shopping at once. A Noble Lie, Oklahoma City 95. You get Citizen Rule Book with it and Infowars.com and in the Fed bumper stickers as well. That's available at Infowars.com. And I mean, it's a life and death situation to expose that, hey, criminal elements in the government engaged in this military gambit. That's what it's called. It's really a gambit. In fact, I'll guarantee you that's what they called it. To demonize domestic groups and move towards using the military against the population. That's when all the, that current plan went into high gear that I became aware of at Oklahoma City. That's what really pushed me to get on air. I saw that, saw the local newscast that folks were mailing down to Austin and getting on Access TV. I was seeing like a week after it was on the news of the bombs being taken out and the governor talking about it and press conferences with Hoppy Heidelberg uh, or uh, uh, General Benton K. Parton. And the, I was watching what, what Oklahomans were seeing. And I, because there were folks sending it down here in a network, I was seeing it on Access TV, and I said, oh, my gosh. I'd already read in history books about Hitler blowing up the Reichstag and stuff. I said, I got I to gotta go get on air. I'm getting the same chills I got back then. And I'm boom, because it's the heart of it. It's how they sell everything else. 
We got to attack Iran. They're going to nuke us. Uh, we got to have checkpoints because you can't be trusted. And, and it's prior restraint. It's saying you're bad. You're a terrorist. You're evil. Our guests will be with us for another 20 minutes. But I tell you, they're so informed and they've got such a great audio and video set up. I want to invite them back up next week to do part two because and, and you know, to really uh, have it prepared, they can send me clips they want to play. And we can kind of go through the film and do a full review. We'll also try to do it on the nightly news. But this is so important. Uh, going back to uh, both of these uh, gentlemen, we're about to go to break here. But we're going to come back in the next 20 minutes, and I'm going to turn the mic off and you know, literally go sit in the control room so you guys can get your points out. But when we come back, what is most important in smoking guns? Well, were you guys threatened? Uh, you know, what else is important for folks to know about the mm -hmm. film? The, uh, the the way the grand jury was given the information, they were very restricted on what they could see. And Judge David Russell, oddly enough, was who presided over the grand jury, was uh, selected. He was on the short list of uh, uh, judges to, who actually selected the defense counsel. He ended up selecting McVeigh's own counsel. So this thing was rigged from, from day one, even on the judicial side. Hoppe Heidelberg comes forward in the movie and pretty much tells it all out. He lays it out, how he was treated, the fact that he wasn't able to get shop drawings, he wasn't able to call the witnesses, he wasn't able to call the ar architects, get any samples of the, the crime scene evidence, and he was given three choices on, on the, uh, uh, the situation. The judge pretty much could have dismissed him without cause, he could have granted uh, Hoppy's wishes on this letter that he wrote to the judge, or he could have said no, and then given reasons why he declined to give Hoppy the information. The judge took the first option of dismissing him from the grand jury without cause. Unbelievable. This is the only guy in the 12-member jury that was asking questions that were relevant to the crime. And the FBI came to his house with their firearms threatening him. Exactly. exactly. He was the only one that actually read the, the juror's handbook, and he knew what his rights were as a federal grand juror and demanded those. They, they weren't going to allow that. And they had Stay to there. Them. Back in one minute. We're doing part one. Uh, this interview live right now with our guest, the producer and the director of the film, A Noble Lie, available at Infowars.com. We were just talking about Hoppy Heidelberg with his Citizen's Rulebook. He actually had one of these. Same ones we sell, the Patriot one about jury nullification, all of it, the rights of a grand juror. And they got pretty upset about that. I think I, I talked to him years ago. From memory, I think he tried to hand these out, too, and that really made him upset. And they just wanted the cover-up to go ahead, uh, but uh, he's in the film. Uh, continue, gentlemen. This is a five-minute segment. We've got a 12-minute segment coming up before you leave us. But continue breaking down a noble lie in the Hoppy Heidelberg point. Well, you were talking about intimidation, and yes, Hoppy was uh, intimidated by the FBI. Or that, well, they tr attempted to uh, intimidate him. He was, uh, wasn't going to have any of that. But we also interview uh, Don Browning. He's a retired Oklahoma City police officer that worked at the canine unit and was there for search and rescue. He said that an FBI agent said that people that, like him that ask questions often end up dead. And he said that it was the way it was presented to him. He thought it was a threat. You know, and oh, of course. Yeah, I mean, uh, wow. I mean, they had their hitmen everywhere. Go ahead. Yeah. And a lot of the people that we interview in the movie, they've, they've stated that this is going to be the last interview they do. So, I mean, this is really the last chance that we, you know, to really encapsulate this story in, into, into one cohesive package. Uh, you know, we've got uh, folks like, uh, you know, Jane Graham, where she said, you know, this is it. She's not going to do another one. Exactly. One other thing that people they'll appreciate this film even more is that the gentleman that actually shot, he was our director of photography, shot the interviews had done the same thing on several uh, anniversaries the last four or five years for Discovery Channel, for History Channel, for National Geographic. He knew firsthand what they, as they say, left on the cutting room floor. And when we approached him, he says, I'm going to do it right for you guys. He says, nothing is going to go on the cutting room floor if I can help it. And by gosh, if our editor kept at least 95% of the interviews on there. So people are going to see what Discovery, what National Geographic, and what History Channel refused to put on the networks. We are going to show it. Yeah, that was our director of photography, Devin Winter. And he said that, uh, you know, they, those uh, interview subjects said the same thing to, to them that they said to us. But this is the first time that it's all going to come out because anything that con contradicted the official story, uh, you know, with these mainstream media outlets obviously got cut. Yeah, I've talked to Jane Graham. And in fact, since a lot of people are riding off of the sunset, that you gave me, well, I already have a lot of their numbers, but we do need to get you guys back on. I forgot that point next week and start having some of them on here and playing some clips just so the public realizes what we're talking about here. I mean, actually hear it from them. They've told all this to the mainstream media, and it never ends up getting out there because this isn't mainstream media. This is lying snake media that has brought our country to this point. 
I see uh, some of the hosts that you know, we look back on the archive footage, and we know who the hosts are. They, of course, they've aged quite a bit since then. I see them at basketball games. I'll see them at a Walmart or a 7-Eleven. They know who I am. They know who James is. We know who they are, and they just avoid us like the plague. They do not even want to talk about this. I mean, they were the, told to shut up. Yeah, in the early hours of the bombing, you know, all of the local news stations were telling the truth. And then after, uh, the, you know, federal uh, boots hit the ground, uh, the story started to change. The only station that really maintained any integrity for, for what, a few months was uh, the local station, Channel 4. Uh, but then the New York Times came in and bought them up and fired everybody that was uh, contradicting the official story and basically silenced uh, any dissent.